it's too much. I struggle with black dog a bit. It would be a bit of a hindrance. Is it too late? Um, no, I, I don't think it is. I mean, I, I went relatively late, but not just five years late. But at the University of Manchester, certainly, we, we like mature students. Um, we like them as part of the, the intake, so we, we take a huge number, it's 280 I think, 285 a year into the degree. And um, we, we find that mature students, because they really want to do it and they're, they're motivated, they're a, they're a very strong influence. And um, so we will drop entrance requirements, etc. Um, for that. And I'm sure most universities feel that way, we certainly do at Manchester. Um, the, the one, the thing I say is, if you're doing physics, as I kind of mentioned before, um, you, you've got to be able to do mathematics. So you, you've got to practice and practice and get that right. But, but I think, I also think on the, the broader question, so, so, so yes, I would imagine that the thing to do is go to speak to an admissions tutor at whichever university you choose and, and talk to them about it. Um, what I would say is I think it should be everybody's right to do that. I think that, and, and it, it gets more difficult in Britain with funding, etc. So the easiest time to do it is when you're 18, 19, 20. And I think that's ridiculous. I think it's a complete waste because many people say to me, you know, I wish I'd, you know, paid more attention at school. I wasn't interested when I was 18, I'm interested now. And it's significantly better for our societies, I think, if anybody who wants to learn is given the opportunity to learn. So, um, but I would say go to an admissions tutor at the University here, at the University of Sydney, and at S. Yeah, I think we've got something interesting here for you, Brian, because we've had a few questions of all the nights we've done the show. Oh, you've, got never... the, you've got the admissions tutor. Well, the... <laughs> <laughs> now, I've never had someone who's typed their question in advance before, so <laughs> here we go. It's actually, it's actually bordering on a mistake now, because you have to ask yourself, what kind of person <laughs> would know a science? <laughs> we're, we're about to find out. Please. What would you like to ask? I'm, I'm a biology teacher. Oh dear. <laughs> uh, this is from a young physics teacher, so here's the question for you. Um, can you please explain the force that would account for a big crunch in the event that the universe was closed? Some reports have stated that dark matter would account for a density of the universe large enough. We're about halfway. Oh, right. <laughs> so, uh, yep, uh, for a gravitational force to cause the expansion of the universe to stop and collapse in on itself. But how could gravity act on the fabric of space-time itself. <laughs> Gravity is explained as just an effect of warp space-time due to the presence of large mass. If you could ideally make the answer shorter than the question that we've There's a lot of superb points in there. So we've had to them, actually, in many ways. So, so yes, the, the, the matter that I talked about um, so that the quarks and the, the electrons, etc., um, we discovered forms about 4.9% of the energy in the universe, just under 5%. About 25% is in the form of dark matter, which is the question I referred to, which you can see because of its gravitational effects. Uh, you see because of the rate that galaxies rotate around, you see that the way the galaxy clusters move, and much of the evidence actually suggests there's another kind of particle in the universe. It's not one of the ones that I talked about. We haven't yet discovered it, but we see its gravitational influence. And then there's dark energy, which is that uh, we mentioned that there's this, this mysterious energy in the universe that's causing the universe to accelerate in its expansion. So when you add all that together, that's about 70% of the energy in the universe, by the way. Again, one of the great mysteries. When you add all that together, you get what, what, essentially what Einstein's equations do. This is the answer to the question. Is they tell you, given a distribution of energy and matter in somewhere, what does the space-time look like? How does it curve? So initially, I suppose, Einstein was concerned with uh, the, the, the orbits in the solar system. One of the first calculations was the orbit of Mercury, which doesn't behave quite as Newton had predicted. So you can say, what's the shape of space-time around the Sun? But what was realised very soon after Einstein had written down his equations in 1916 was you can ask the question for the universe. You can say, given a distribution of matter and energy on the average in the universe, uh, what does the shape of space-time look like? And the shape of space-time tells you the shape of space and the evolution of the universe in time. It's a whole lot. 
And so um, what you do in cosmology is you, is you put in those components, you get your, your density of dark matter and matter and radiation actually as well, and you get a dark, a dark energy, you put them in, and you, you, you out comes basically a, a, an equation telling you the expansion rate of the universe and the shape of space, that they separate actually in the simplest assumptions that the universe is the same everywhere in the same every direction. Um, so, so you do that, so that's how it works. And, and the, the, the graph I showed you earlier, actually, is basically that. It's talking about the, the expansion of the universe, the history of the universe, the proposed, the, the predicted future of the universe, given the distribution of matter and energy in it. And I think that's what you were asking. It's just tremendous, actually, that it, it was interesting, just a historical point. It was the first time this was done was in the 1920s by uh, George Lamartra and others, and, and Friedman, and, and the, the equations you get out are called the Friedman equations. And what they assumed, well, it's very difficult to solve Einstein's equations, so they assumed that the universe is the same everywhere and the same in every direction. It's called homogeneous and isotropic. And they got out to prediction that the universe has to be either expanding or contracting, which is essentially the prediction of the Big Bang. So the Lamartra predicted uh, that, that there may have been a Big Bang, an origin to the universe, before Hubble did the experimental observations to see that galaxies all appear to be flying away from us. So, yeah. Great stuff. That was a fantastic question for a biology teacher, so may I say, okay. No, 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 it means that, it means that biology teachers can read physics. <laughs> <laughs> it does. It's a statement of fact. You did. You read physics. What would you like to ask? What would you like to ask, Brian? I like listening to your show, The Infinite Monkey Cage. And I'd like to ask you a question, which is, at what point does a strawberry die? Oh, God. Oh, God. This, this is really great. How many people listen to Monkey Cage? Yay! Why is this good? The, the producer of the show, because I was saying we should do a Monkey Cage in Australia. A couple, shouldn't we? We should come yes. to the university. And the producer of the show is saying, oh, I don't want to see. <laughs> well, we should, so I think that's it now. We'll come back and do it. The, yeah, we, did, uh, we did one about, um, I think it's called What is Life. It's about life. It was a biology based show. And I went into a, d a debate with them about a strawberry. Because I just asked this question of the, the panel. Because I thought, is, is a strawberry dead? Because it's a thing, it's not really metabolizing. Um, but if you bury it in the ground, it turns into a strawberry bush. So it's obviously not dead. But the definition of life and death is that the, the biologists have all sorts of definitions. So we're going to a long debate about it. And then I, I don't know is the answer. I never got a clear answer to whether it's, you're a biology teacher. It's a strawberry death. <laughs> <laughs> it's yes. After you pick it, it's dead. But well, then when you plant it, it comes back to life. I like to see. Yeah, I know that. I know that. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> I think what we have established is next time you come back, you're going to do some of the monkey here. You can, yeah, yeah, yeah. And you can download them on iTunes. Fantastic stuff. No, actually, I've got to say that if you, if you go to iTunes to get them, there's one we just did, it's on space exploration with the Shakespearean actor Brian Blessed. Yeah. And uh, yeah, really yeah, cool. yeah, that was really good. That was awesome. It didn't flash golden. And uh, we, we, we went to do this thing, we, we, he said, he's famous for saying, Gordon's alive! <laughs> and we, we had him do this whole thing, Gordon's alive! Or dead. In fact, it's alive and dead. It's in a linear superposition of alive and dead. And he just has to shout those things out. And they shout, I want it. to go to Mars! And then start shouting out there. So, wow. okay. yeah. I it's recommend funny, it though. for a bizarre experience. <laughs> it sounded a bit like Patrick Stewart. I thought it sounded a bit like Patrick Stewart. Hi, I'm Brian. I'm a musician, not a scientist, so I apologise to everyone who already knows this answer. But um, that radio telescope that's been built in Western Australia, yeah. the dishes were in a very random sort of a pattern. I was wondering what advantage that gives you. That's a brilliant question. Yes. Mm. Um, Let's have a round of applause for that great question. Oh. I don't know. I'd be just out of thinking about it. I suspect it does. That's the reason. I, I, and it's probably to do with. Um, the, the way the, the reason you build them like that is that when you link them all together, you get this large effective area of the dish. But it's obviously pieces of the big dish, as it were. So I suspect there may be a reason, some sort of interference. Is any radio astronomers in the audience? No. It's there. Why? <laughs> Just wait a second, big guy, my boy. <laughs> <laughs> this is good. 
this is science being done. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, so um, it's basically you get a skin wave if you have them in too many different, uh, you know, same locations. Yeah. So if you put it in different areas, it's, it's a literally random pattern. So we just sort of throw them around the place and then it reduces noise when we do our. Um, so you know, as you know, everyone, the, the planet turns, and so over 12 hours, the entire array turns. And so that, with a random pattern, actually covers all of the area that we want to cover without leaving any gaps. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Is that in, in science, that there are, don't know is a very good question. Don't guess. Right? If you don't know, you say you don't know, and you answer. That's the very important. Absolutely.